Well, good afternoon. Uh, it is uh, my pleasure to uh, welcome everyone to this uh, next uh, and third to last, I don't know what the word for that is, third to last uh, noon conference of this uh, academic year. Um, before I introduce uh, today's speaker, I just want to remind everyone that next Wednesday, um, we will have the Bill Meadow debate um, in collaboration with the Department of Pediatrics. Um, and the topic for discussion is, do we still need doctors? Um, so I would encourage you uh, to come and you know, make your position known. Um, uh, so it's a pleasure to uh, and introduce uh, today's speaker. I think uh, the fellows know uh, Professor Koch very well, but uh, Valerie Gutman Koch is an, assist an assistant professor of law and the co-director of the Health Law and Policy Institute at the University of Houston Law Center. Um, and she is also the director of law and ethics here at the McLean Center. Uh, previously, Professor Koch was special advisor and senior attorney to New York State Task Force on Life and the Law the state's bioethics commission where she crafted policy and guidance related to pandemic preparedness, crisis standards of care, human subjects research, surrogate decision-making among others. Um, following law school, she practiced in the intellectual property litigation practice at Kirkland and Ellis. Um, uh, as a, a scholar in bioethics, public policy and health law, Professor Koch concentrates on how medical and technology advances have informed and sometimes transformed various areas of law, identifying ways in which law and policy is or is not equipped to address changes in technology and practice. Um, she earned her uh, law degree from Harvard and her bachelor's degree from Princeton. There are some schools in the East you may have heard of. Um, so anyway, it is a real uh, pleasure for me uh, to uh, welcome uh, Professor Koch. Well, thank you, Dr. Angelos, for having me. Um, as I apparently am wont to do in this setting, um, I decided somewhat last minute to change my topic, but it is a topic that I think is very relevant to um, the theme of this year's uh, series. So talking about, um, it's a very present challenge in contemporary bioethics. So I'm gonna be talking about embryos, liability and personhood. And so what I'm gonna to do to give you a little bit of uh, um, what, the, what, what I will be planning on covering today, um, I'll give a brief overview of the current, as well as some imagined uses of reproductive technologies. Then I'll turn to the topic of liability associated with those technologies, um, in particular focusing on IVF and pre-implantation genetic testing. Um, and specifically, I'll talk about informed consent, wrongful birth, and wrongful life cases, in, uh, as well as wrongful death cases. I will, in other words, I'll be talking about tort liability, um, or what happens when something goes wrong with the use of assisted reproduction. And then I'll talk about the, that fourth one, um, wrongful death. And in particular, I'll address the recent decision, the Page versus Center for Reproductive Medicine, which was the Alabama decision recently that held the frozen embryos are persons under state law. And finally, I'll address some of the key implications of that decision and the fetal personhood movement. So first, a little bit of background for uh, the most popular Reproductive technologies, I'll do. There we go, I can use that, okay. Um, so some brief background on some of the most popular reproductive technologies, um, IVF and uh, pre-implantation genetic testing. So the first IVF birth in the United States was reported in 1981. IVF or in vitro fertilization is commonly used to aid would-be parents in conceiving a child. The procedure involves retrieving the donor's egg and sperm and combining the two gametes in a laboratory dish and then implanting the resulting embryo in a person's uterus. 
the entire IVF experience can be very onerous, and this becomes very relevant later in my lecture. Um, the egg retrieval process itself requires hormonal treatments and surgeries, and the entire process can be also very expensive. One cycle averages about $30,000. Thus, multiple embryos are usually created in a single round of IVF, but only one or perhaps two or three will actually be implement, implanted. Typically, approximately three or four embryos need to be created to achieve a single pregnancy. Any additional or excess embryos are usually frozen and stored so that multiple embryos can be created in a single expensive round of IVF. These embryos can be stored in a frozen state until someone is ready to implant them, or they can be thawed and donated for research purposes or destroyed. In other words, the more embryos that are created, the greater the chance of a pregnancy, Cryopreservation helps avoid having to undergo multiple egg cycles um, or transferring multiple embryos at once. It also allows for delayed transfer when, for example, someone is undergoing medical treatment such as chemotherapy. Uh, Pre-implantation genetic diagnosis and screening is often used in conjunction with IVF. As part of this process, potential parents undergo IVF and then after the harvested egg is fertilized, the embryos are left to develop to the eight cell, cell stage, at which point one cell is removed. The genetic material from that blastomere is tested through various diagnostic services for genetic or chromosomal abnormalities. And then a, it's another screen, um, an unaffected embryo is transferred to the person's uterus to implant. Nine years after the first IVF was, baby was born in the US, so in 1990, the first pregnancy was established after pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. In 1990, Alan Handyside and his colleagues reported the first established pregnancies after pre-implantation genetic testing was performed for an X-linked disorder. Today, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis or pre-implantation genetic screening is used in at least 4% of all IVF cycles. So I'm not delving into these today, but generally you can categorize the ethical concerns with using these technologies as being twofold. The first includes are these wholesale objections to the use of these technologies, often because they involve the intentional destruction of human embryos. That one I will be getting to later in the talk. And the second is the objection to selecting embryos based on genetic testing. There's a myriad of uh, debate and uh, scholarship around this question of the appropriate use of pre-implantation genetic testing. And I'll talk about some of those uses in a moment. So pre-implantation genetic testing is used for all sorts of reasons. It's increasingly used to avoid embryos with an abnormal set of chromosomes, um, the leading cause of implanta implantation failure, miscarriage, and congenital abnormalities. So it's used to achieve pregnancies. It may also be used to select or rule out Implant, implantation of embryos with diseases like Tay-Sachs disease or other devastating diseases that manifest in infancy or early childhood. In many cases, IVF combined with PGD is an alternative to prenatal testing and subsequently pregnancy termination for would-be parents seeking to avoid having a child with these diseases. PGT may also theoretically be used to select against implantation of embryos with mutations in genes that may result in the resulting individuals developing a devastating disease in adulthood, such as Huntington's disease. Some have challenged whether PGT should be used to screen for embryos for risk of late onset diseases, such as Alzheimer's disease or Huntington's, as well as for certain rate types of cancer. 
um, or sorry, not Huntington's, but Alzheimer's and other types of cancer in which genetic mutations confer an increased risk of developing a disease in adulthood. In light of emerging treatments, the promise of future cures, and the inconclusive nature of tests, PGD for diseases that may not present themselves for many decades or not at all, um, necessitate increased ethical scrutiny. In 2018, sorry, the number, date is wrong on that one. Um, the American Society for Reproductive Medicine or ASRM issued its guidance for use of PGD for adult onset conditions. It came to two major conclusions. First, it stated that it is ethically justifiable when the condition is serious and when there are no safe, effective interventions for the condition or the availability of interventions are either inadequately effective or significantly burdensome. Further, it opined that for conditions that are less serious or of lower penetrance, PGT for adult onset conditions is ethically acceptable as a matter of reproductive liberty. It should be discouraged, however, the risks are found to be more than merely speculative. Another potential, although less frequently used, use of PGD is for the creation of so-called savior siblings. In such cases, families have an already born child with congenital or acquired bone marrow diseases who need a stem cell transplant to live. The patients undergo IVF and then PGD for human leukocyte antigen or HLI typing in order to have another child who would serve as a source of stem cells, either obtained from that child's umbilical cord blood or bone marrow. So the first known savior sibling, Adam Nash, and his older sister, Molly, who were, was born with a severe type of Fikoni anemia um, that occurred, I don't have the year, um, but it, it's been around for a while. Um, Molly's parents underwent IVF and embryonic testing for both Fikoni's anemia and HLA type so that Adam, the resulting child, could donate his umbilical cord blood to save his sister's life. We could devote an entire lecture to the legal and ethical implications of undergoing PGD for HLA matching, but briefly, concerns include the imposition of the risks of IVF or embryo biopsy and later possible intrusive medical interventions on a healthy child for the benefit of someone else, commodification or exploitation of a child, and treating a child as means to an end. In response to such arguments, scholars have countered that the child will be no less loved or cared for due to the circumstances of his or her birth. John Robertson, a law professor at the University of Texas, Austin, stated that in fact, that because the child's quote, birth might save the life of an existing loved child, it might only quote, increase its specialness. Couples have, have children for all sorts of reasons, um, including saving a marriage, et cetera, because their peers are doing so, or because contraception failed. Thus, supporters of the right to use PGD for HLA matching maintain that the donor child would still be desired and loved by his or her family. PGD may also increasingly be used for non-therapeutic purposes choosing for certain traits such as hair color, eye color, et cetera. One of those examples, uh, the most controversial is sex selection. Um, it's considered non-therapeutic when used for family balancing rather than avoiding sex-linked diseases. Although in the United States, research indicates that patient preferences appear to be equally balanced between the sexes, many worry that sex selection could lead to greater disparities in the sex ratio of the population, like in other countries, such as China and India. Others express concern that sex selection will further emphasize and reinforce unnecessary and archaic gender expectations. This I'll talk about in a moment, but it talks about the fact that um, 28, or sorry, 42% uh, of uh, clinics offer PGD for sex selection. 
finally, and uh, of particular interest to many in our society, sorry about that, um, is the potential use of PGD to tr uh, choose for certain traits the society generally views as undesirable. So in such cases, parents who often have certain quote unquote defects, for example, deafness, will seek to transfer embryos that test positive for those same traits. It is argued that in those instances, the child is still able to live a worthwhile life while also enabling the child to be like their parents um, and a member of the parent's community and culture. In many instances, the trait is considered an identity or rather than a medical illness that should be avoided, treated, and cured. For example, although it didn't involve PGT, in 2002, a same-sex deaf couple sought a deaf sperm donor to increase the chances that their child would also be deaf. This led to intense media and public scrutiny, um, which is not yet abated when it arises today. So as I mentioned, this is a, the results of a Johns Hopkins study. It's from 2008. So these numbers have probably changed since then. Um, but these are the types of PGD that have been provided by IVF clinics. Um, again, according to the data, 42% of IVF PGD clinics provide testing for non-medical sex selection. 28% uh, provide PGD for adult onset disorders, such as Huntington's disease, Alzheimer's disease, and breast cancer. Um, approximately 24% had performed PGD for HLI typing in order to create a savior, savior sibling. And 3% had provided PGD to select for an embryo with the genes predisposing the, predisposing the child to a disability. According to the National ART, Assisted Reproductive Technologies Surveillance System, over 413,000 total IVF cycles were conducted in the year 2021, resulting in over 112,000 pregnancies and 97,000 total infants born. Between 40 and 60% of IVF cycles actually used pre-implantation genetic testing. So this shows that over 771,000 babies were born from assisted reproduction in the decade between 2012 and 2021. So in the context of the ethical limits and liabilities for using pre-implantation genetic testing specifically, what's special about this technology? So unlike other assisted reproductive technologies and interventions, we use it after conception, but before implementa implantation. Thus, the concept of potential life or even personhood is at play. But generally, questions of privacy and bodily integrity of the gestational parent are not. In other words, because if all goes well, only unaffected embryos are transferred to the uterus for implantation, pre-implantation genetic testing is presented as an attractive alternative to some post-implantation diagnostic procedures, for example, amniocentesis or uh, CVS, which are frequently followed by the difficult decision of pregnancy determination if results are unfavorable. And in states that are now banning or severely restricting the access to abortions, this presents currently an attractive alternative to avoiding pregnancies that they would have avoided otherwise. But this distinction may become less relevant as the right to seek a legal abortion becomes increasingly limited and as the personhood movement that I'll get to by the end of this talk uh, becomes more entrenched. So Dove Fox, uh, a law professor at the University of San Diego, refers to harms that occur at this stage as confounded reproduction, meaning that a desired pregnancy and birth will occur, but the fetus or baby has traits not intended due to use of assisted reproduction. Professor Fox also uses confounded reproduction to refer to situations where eggs are fertilized with the wrong sperm or where embryos are implanted into the wrong uterus. 
The American Society for Reproductive Medicine, ASRM, has ethical guidance for such situ situations. In 2016, it updated its uh, disclosure of medical errors and ga involving gametes and embryos, an ethics committee opinion. Um, its recommendations address ensuring that gametes and embryos are not switched or harmed during the assisted reproductive process. However, the organization's recommendations focus on disclosure of such egregious errors as switched er embryos that result in, quote, the birth of a child with a different genetic parentage, parentage than intended. In considering cases involving medical errors in assisted reproduction, the ASRM emphasized autonomy and fairness due to the unique aspects of reproductive technologies. It highlighted the sensitive nature of the doctor-patient relationship in the reproductive context, stating principles of open and honest communication with patients have special significance in reproductive medicine. Fertility treatments are often stressful and patients may be particularly sensitive to the statements of their healthcare providers. In addition, errors in reproductive medicine may affect the couple's ability to have a child in situations in which errors are particularly serious, where embryos are mistakenly transferred to the wrong patient. The error may lead to the birth of a different child than was intended. Such births can lead to significant emotional turmoil and the burdens of parentage or custody lawsuits, which can adversely affect all involved parties, including the children. So assisted reproduction is often referred to as the wild west of medicine. There is literal, little federal or even state regulation or oversight of IVF clinics. So in light of the dearth of statutory law and regulations that govern the use of these technologies, what happens when something goes wrong, right? ASRM has guidance about disclosures, but what happens when something actually happens. And this isn't a hypothetical question. Um, a 2008, again, comprehensive study of US fertility clinics found that one in five of these clinics report errors in diagnosing, labeling, and handling donor samples and embryos for implantation. So what kind of mistakes or wrongs can occur? Clinics can be negligent in their storage of cryopreserved embryos resulting in their destruction or they're being exposed to devastating disease. Embryos can be mixed up. For example, an IVF clinic can implant the wrong embryo resulting in the birth of parents, uh, in the birth of, sorry, resulting in the birth parents not being the intended biological parents. Providers can be negligent in testing, selecting, and implanting IVF embryos, often grounded in a provider's failure to detect a genetic anomaly or warn the parents uh, of the potential for genetic anomaly and the resultant birth of a child with that anomaly. This can occur when results are not properly communicated or where the wrong embryo is implanted. On the flip side, it's possible that where parents seek to have a child with certain, at least socially anomalous traits, as we discussed before, this might um, avoid uh, include a parent seeking to have a child who, like her parents, is deaf, and the child is born without that trait, there's the possibility that they'll seek compensation in the legal system. Further, Parents might claim that the provider failed to properly inform them of the inherent errors associated with the pre-implantation genetic process or failed to inform them of, of a facility's minimal experience in performing certain types of testing or failed to inform patients of pre-implantation genetic testing as a treatment option. So when wrongs occur, there may be significant medical, psychological, and economic implications for those individuals who assisted reproduct, who use assisted reproduction to improve the chances of achieving a pregnancy or to avoid genetic disease. Those who are harmed due to a, to a provider or clinic mistake may rely on a number of types of tort claims, liability claims. 
The most basic claim is a negligence claim. And most claims that have or can be brought by one party against another with respect to assisted reproduction are types of negligence claims. There are no consistent rules specific to the provision of assisted reproduction in the liability context, particularly because negligence rules differ state to state. It's very jurisdiction specific. But there are four types of negligence claims that are often brought in the context of assisted reproduction. Informed consent, wrongful birth, wrongful life, and wrongful death. To prevail on a negligence claim, the plaintiff has to prove four elements. That the defendant owed a duty to the plaintiff, that the defendants breached that duty, that the breach caused harm, that's causation, and that the type of harm resulted in, pay, in damages. So while I discuss these types of claims, I'm gonna rely on some illustrative cases. Many of these types of claims are settled before they ever see the inside of a court, side of a courtroom. So there's not a lot of data about how often these cases are brought, how much they're settled for. I found some, of, um, some numbers that I'll get to in a little bit, but we don't have sort of a holistic overview of how many of these types of claims are brought, how many are settled, how much they're settled for, et cetera. So informed consent. Informed consent claims are based on the failure of healthcare providers or clinics to disclose information regarding medical options. In the case of pre-implantation genetic testing, such claims may involve the failure to disclose the risks of fetal abnormality, birth defects, or even undesirable traits in a resulting child. In one case, um, a couple alleged that the IVF pro program at Columbia University and uh, Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center failed to conduct a pre-implantation genetic test to ascertain whether the donor egg had genetic disease. The couple's child was born with cystic fibrosis, and the couple alleged that they were told, not told that the donor had a history of mental illness or genetic diseases, and they were never told or given information about the potential for cystic fibrosis. The New York court stated that the parents were, would be permitted to quote, vigorously pursue recovery for monetary damages resulting from having to care for a child with cystic fibrosis. And the party settled for $1.3 million before trial. In a similar case, parents sued an IVF clinic for failure to inform them of the option of pre-implantation genetic testing. After their child was born with Down syndrome, the South Carolina couple sued the fertility clinic in Charlotte, North Carolina, that had provided the IVF services, alleging that the clinic's failure to offer IVF patients with the option of pre-implantation genetic testing led to, quote, substantial financial expenses. They claimed that they should have been informed of the option for pre-implantation genetic testing before their initial IVF cycle. The case was never decided on the merits. The court didn't hear this case um, in total, but rather uh, the court dismissed it due to lack of jurisdiction. So we don't really know how this case would have turned out. But even going to court is expensive and onerous, right? Um, wrongful birth. So wrongful birth claims arise when parents object to the birth of an unwanted or unplanned child. So in such cases, the parents allege that the physician failed to warn them of the risk of conceiving or giving birth to a child with a serious genetic disorder arguing that the birth of an ill or disabled child caused the parent's harm. Um, in these cases, then, parents are recovering for the harm that they experience from the healthcare provider's negligence, which resulted in the birth of the unwanted or disabled child. More than half of the states in the United States permit wrongful birth actions. Because these claims are intended to help the parents be compensated for their injury, damages in wrongful birth cases are limited to the costs of raising a child until the age of majority. 
While this seems pretty comprehensive, it, the damages that a parent can access in these types of cases are pretty limited. They don't address the individual's ability to choose whether to continue a pregnancy or even start a pregnancy in the case of PGT. And most intangible losses can be really difficult to compensate. So in the largest uh, individual award in Washington state history, a jury awarded $50 million to a couple whose son was born with quote, unbalanced chromosome translocation leading to profound mental and physical disabilities. The parents had brought this wrongful birth case against the medical center and its lab, alleging that the lab missed the translocation because the medical center mishandled the genetic test and failed to send vital info to it, to the lab. Um, the couple claimed that had um, they known of the genetic disease, they would have ended the pregnancy. In another case, a couple underwent IVF and PGD with the sole intention, the only reason they did this, was to avoid having a child with cystic fibrosis. The parents were known carriers, and after um, IVF of 10 eggs by NYU personnel, biopsies of each embryo were sent to Genesis Genetics, a company that specializes in providing pre-implantation genetic uh, laboratory services in order to be tested. And the report faxed to the NYU IVF clinic identified two embryos, those numbered eight and 10, as quote, carrier maternal, okay to transfer. Embryologists and an endocrinologist at NYU instead substituted a different embryo that labeled embryo seven, which had been labeled as a carrier at worst for um, substituted that for embryo 10. And so the NYU defendants subsequently implanted embryo seven. Two weeks after the child's birth, the daughter was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis. The couple alleged that the New York University IVF facilities and Genesis Genetics was negligent in their embryo screening program. The gross bombs sought damages for emotional distress, the cost and expenses of medical care, and continuing care for the child after the age of majority. The court granted the defendant's motion for summary judgment on procedural grounds and uh, did not decide the merits of the case. So the case was eventually decided for the defendants based on procedural grounds. Wrongful life. So wrongful life claims are those brought by the child where the child as represented by the child's parents or a guardian claims that it would not that it would have been better off never having lived at all and but for the physician or the parents negligence would not in fact have lived in other words the child sues based on the argument that he or she shouldn't have ever been born in such cases had the defendants done their job correctly, the plaintiff, again, would never have been born. So wrongful life claims are not about whether but for the defendant's negligence, the child would have had a healthy, unimpaired life. Instead, the claim is that without the doctor or the parent's negligence, the, parent, the child should never have existed. Most, uh, so Joel Feinberg um, and others have argued that in certain, quote, extreme cases, generally where the resulting life of the child is, quote, not worth living. It is, quote, rational to prefer not to have to come into existence at all. Most jurisdictions refuse to recognize wrongful life. Only the Supreme Courts of California, uh, Washington, and New Jersey uh, have recognized wrongful life causes of action. And even in these jurisdictions, how recovery has been limited to the extraordinary medical and educational expenses associated with the impairment. So again, recovery is limited, just like it's limited in wrongful birth claims, is wrong, it's limited in wrongful life cases. One of the key uh, objections to these claims rests on the problem of the slippery slope. While not involving reproductive technologies, uh, this case was actually decided in 1963, so before IVF was readily available or available at all, a court here in Illinois decided the case Zepeda versus Zepeda, 
In that case, the court worried that finding for the son in a wrongful life suit against his father would encourage him to seek our others to seek damages for being born of a certain color, another because of race, one for being born with a hereditary disease, another for inheriting unfortunate family characteristics, one for being born into a large and destitute family, another because a parent has an unsavory reputation. So as we see in 2016, in 2000, a child attempted to distinguish PGD from the general wrongful life jurisprudence like Zepeda versus Zepeda, arguing that a wrongful life claim is appropriate in the context of pre-implantation genetic testing. The Doolins were both carriers of the gene for cystic fibrosis and had already had a child with the disease. Uh, they underwent IVF with PGD solely for the purpose of avoiding having another child with C CF. Despite these efforts, a child, Thomas, was born with cystic fibrosis, and he sued the IVF providers for wrongful life. The court held that Thomas did not have a claim, noting that the same fundamental problem of logic existed with previous wrongful life cases. There was no way the infant could, quote, ever have been born without cystic fibrosis. Thomas himself could never have been born without the disease. The court could therefore not compare the value of existence with the value of non-existence. And with the news out of Alabama, we have a renewed focus on a fourth type of claim, wrongful life. Historically, a majority of jurisdictions have permitted wrongful life claims on behalf of injured fetuses, but only if the injury occurred after the point of viability. However, six states, Georgia, Illinois, Louisiana, Missouri, South Dakota, and West Virginia, have upheld the right to pursue wrongful death claims for a pre-viable embryo or fetus. To be clear, this case in LePage in Alabama wasn't the first time that a claim for wrongful death was brought against an IVF clinic for its negligent destruction of embryos um, that were intended to be cryopreserved. So in 2008, here in Illinois, a similar lawsuit was brought. In that case, the circuit court held that pre-embryos or fertilized eggs um, prior to 14 days of development are, quote, human beings within the meaning of the Illinois Wrongful Death Act. However, in that case, the Court of Appeals held that the Wrongful Death Act did not allow a cause of action for loss of an embryo created by in vitro fertilization that had not yet been implanted in a person. So just to back up about sort of all of these negligence claims before I jump into the Alabama case, so there's one study uh, that looked at malpractice liability in the U.S. Um, between 2000 and 2020. Uh, they evaluated 184,000 um, IVF cycles with 176 incidents, resulting in 30 settled claims. Payments were made to plaintiffs in 21 of those claims, resulting in $15 million of awarded damages. So the average award was about $200,000. It found that misdiagnosis and errors in diagnosis are among the most costly allegations in medical malpractice across the board. Another study reviewed malpractice litigations involving IVF between 1999 and 2022. Of the 53 cases at, at one specific clinic, um, of the 53 cases that were identified, 24 um, involved embryology errors, so lost specimens or incorrect sperm donors. Um, 11 involved pre-implantation genetic testing errors. So for example, a child was born with a genetic illness despite the testing. And three involved misrepresentation of IVF outcomes. Okay, so back to wrongful death. What exactly happened in Alabama? So the plaintiffs were three couples who had all already gone on um, IVF, uh, undergone IVF uh, at a fertility clinic in the state. And they all became pregnant and they all gave birth to healthy babies. And they all had excess embryos. And so those excess embryos were cryopreserved at the fertility clinic which was located within the hospital. 
And in December of 2020, and this, the facts of this are very weird, but apparently a patient of that hospital, not affiliated with the clinic at all, wandered into the clinic, uh, walked into the cryopreservation unit, opened one of the tanks and grabbed some of the embryos with his ungloved hand, um, burning himself and dropping several embryos on the floor that were then destroyed. So the hospital, or sorry, the plaintiffs, these families, these couples, um, brought lawsuits against the clinic and the hospital under the state's wrongful death of a minor act, which had been passed in 1872. So over a hundred years before the first IVF baby was born in the United States. At the trial court level, the case was dismissed. The trial judge said that embryos that exist in vitro aren't people or children for the purposes of the state law. The couples appealed that decision to the Supreme Court of Alabama, which held that the act did apply. Calling the fertility clinic a cryogenic nursery and frozen embryos extra uterine children, the court held, quote, that the wrongful death of a minor act applies to all unborn children regardless of their location. In a concurrence, I just love this reading, uh, this, this uh, language, the concurrence to this decision, one of the, at least one of the justices wrote, the theologically based view of the sanctity of life adopted by the people of Alabama encompasses the following. One, God made every person in his image. Two, every person therefore has a value that far exceeds the ability of human beings to calculate. And three, human life cannot be wrongfully destroyed without incurring the wrath of a holy God who views the destruction of his image as an affront to himself. The law, this act, section 3606, recognizes that this is true of unborn human life no less than it is of all human life, that even before birth, all human beings bear the image of God and their lives cannot be destroyed without effacing his glory. So this is a far departure from our understanding of what embryos were or are before this case. So historically, we have this case, Tennessee case. Um, historically, courts have followed the precedent that was established in this Tennessee decision in 1992, Davis versus Davis. Um, before this case was decided, courts were often torn. Are embryos persons? Are they property? What are they? Um, they were generally uncomfortable designating embryos as simply property like this pen, um, but they also recognized that calling embryos persons was legally problematic. And so instead, the court attempted to assign a mid-level status to the embryo. It declared that frozen embryos deserve special respect. All that said, in this particular case, ultimately, the outcome of this case resulted in the embryos being destroyed. So I'm not really sure how much respect was actually afforded to these particular embryos, but regardless, they existed in this sort of limbo state. They were, they deserved special respect. So in its opinion, declaring that frozen embryos were in fact persons under state law, the Alabama Supreme Court recognized the immediate implications that its decisions would have on IVF services in the state, but it said it's not our role to consider them. Based on this decision, immediately IVF clinics in the state were rightly concerned that their practice would lead to charges of involuntary manslaughter or homicide. So three of the state's very limited pool of IVF providers including the Alabama University of Alabama at Birmingham, immediately paused services, sending some families out of state to access treatment. In response, the Alabama legislature scrambled to pass a law to protect access to IVF in the state. It aims to provide civil and criminal immunity to providers and patients for the destruction of, or damage uh, um, for destruction or damage to embryos. Specifically, it shields providers from prosecution and civil lawsuits, quote, for the damage to or death of an embryo during IVF services. Some, but not all, providers then resumed IVF shortly thereafter. Significantly, the outcome in LePage was apparently inconsistent with the intent of the plaintiffs. 
They had no desire, they say, to shut down opportunities for others to access reproductive technologies. They benefited from them. They wanted others to benefit from it. But the court's approach isn't surprising. Courts routinely decline to grant remedies where reproduction, uh, where reproductive professionals negligently deprive, impose, or confound procreation, as we saw in those other contexts. As we've seen, existing law is inadequate to redressing reproductive injuries. So perhaps the plaintiffs in this case would not have resorted to fetal personhood arguments if, they had if we had previously, as a society, adopted an approach previously proposed by Professor Dove Fox. He's recognized the inadequacies of our piecemeal approach to liability for wrongs that occur in the process of pursuing reproduction. He highlights the need, the fact that errors often go unchecked in a profession that operates free of meaningful regulation. And in response, he's proposed a new tort claim or a private right of action for reproductive negligence that results from procreative, I'm uh, sorry, for, from procreation imposed, procreation deprived, and procreation confounded. But in the absence of such a cause of action, this may have seemed like the best option for the plaintiffs to recover for the destruction of their embryos. And importantly, under this law, as we saw in wrongful birth and informed consent and wrongful life claims, it's very difficult to fully be compensated for injuries. It's very difficult to, um, to fully recover. But the Alabama law at issue in this case not only allowed full recovery, allowed for punitive damages, which can be incredibly large. And so the plaintiffs, really, this was their best option to feel like they were being made whole and being compensated. But the Alabama's Supreme Court's labeling of frozen embryos of children is not the way to hold fertility clinics accountable for negligently storing embryos. But here we are, and this case is probably not an aberration. So many states have enacted or are considering fetal personhood laws, many of which would extend to embryos created in vitro. Um, 11 states besides Alabama have fetal personhood laws. For example, that's the slide, sorry. For example, a Louisiana statute on the book since 1986 defines an embryo outside the body as, quote, a jurisdictional person whose destruction is categorically forbidden. Georgia's law grants rights to fetuses, including tax breaks and child support. Already today, judges in many states are appointing legal representation for fetuses in abortion disputes. In 2022, at least 10 states had proposed bills that would accord legal personhood status to frozen embryos specifically. So the Alabama decision specifically targets embryos created outside the uterus before pregnancy has been achieved. Significantly, the new law that's passed in, result, uh, in response to the Alabama Supreme Court's decision did not address the issue of personhood at the heart of LePage. It didn't address the legal status of the embryo that's created in an IVF lab. In fact, the decision bolsters support for fetal personhood generally. And recognizing that embryos are persons under the law may have a number of far ranging implications. So um, embryonic personhood status implicates would be parents access to reproductive technologies and the chance to become would be parents or biological parents. According to the Department of Health and Human Services, there are more than 600,000 prior preserved embryos in the United States. IVF usually involves discarding embryos. PGD certainly does. So most of those cryopreserved embryos may eventually result, not result in live births. They might result in either being frozen indefinitely or being destroyed. In response to the personhood movement, in order to avoid destruction of the embryos, fertility care may be drastically regulated in the future. That could mean limiting IVF procedures to create only one embryo per cycle or forbidding cryopreservation or embryos. Or alternatively, it might incentivize clinics to transfer multiple embryos in a single cycle, resulting in higher risk multiple births. 
this is not the standard of care for fertility treatment because it's more dangerous to the pregnant person. So in other words, embryonic personhood and the consequent regulation of assisted reproduction interferes in the doctor-patient relationship. And it undercuts the ability of physicians and clinicians to provide the best care possible. And even when embryos aren't destroyed under child endangerment laws, physicians and clinics could be charged with manslaughter for disposing of, freezing, or generally mishandling an embryo. The specter of civil or even criminal liability for any actions that put embryos at risk creates immense tension between providing quality patient care and protecting oneself. Relatedly, Affording personhood status to embryos not yet implanted would mean that would-be parents may have to go through multiple expensive, painful, and time-consuming IVF cycles to achieve a single pregnancy. Even before the Supreme Court's decision in Dobbs and the Alabama Supreme Court's decision in LePage, the Center for Reproductive Rights had identified disparities in access to IVF in the United States, particularly for people of color, low-income households, people with disabilities, and LGBTQ plus communities. The report noted that Black women report infertility at an 80% higher rate than other groups, but only account for less than 20% of fertility, infertility care. And while the Alabama legislature acted quickly to protect access to IVF in the state, even that decision raises serious questions of equity. Although infertility affects around 12% of couples, assisted reproduction can be very expensive, even in its current form. So those who seek and access reproductive, reproductive technologies are usually amongst the most privileged. Declaring embryos to be persons under the law would also effectively limit the opportunities to access technologies that are used in conjunction with IVF. In the, if the point of say PGT is to test embryos at an early stage, for any of the reasons I listed earlier, it follows that those embryos that don't fit the criteria will be destroyed. But embryonic personhood would preclude using PGT or any other technologies if doing so would lead to embryo destruction. Further, as Jean Judith Dar has stated, passing a state law that would distinguish infertility patients from those seeking an abortion risk having a discriminatory impact, quote, Given that the majority of IVF patients are white, while women of color account for the majority of all abortions performed in the United States. Protecting those with means, as well as protecting the market itself, the assisted reproductive technology market was worth $25.9 billion in 2022, is a big incentive for the legislature to step in. Assisted reproduction is a moneymaker. Abortion is not. Do I have a few minutes? I know we started a little bit late. Okay, I don't want to overdo. Okay. Um, in addition, um, the legal personhood movement might lead to the state law mandates regarding the adoption of patients' unused embryos, sometimes referred to as snowflake adoptions by those in the anti-abortion movement. Supporters of embryo adoption thus far have almost exclusively hailed from specific religious communities. In that case, agencies match donors who have undergone IVF and have unused fertilized embryos with would-be parents, and then agents interview and screen donors and nonies, suggest pairings, and facilitate the embryo transfer. With the rise in fetal personhood efforts, embryo adoption may become one of the only options for those with excess embryos who no longer wish to have further pregnancies. However, many in our society would be distressed by the idea of having biological offspring out there in the world. Embryo personhood would also effectively ban stem cell research. Um, embryonic stem cell research has always been subject to intense ethical and legal scrutiny. Since the first human embryonic stem cell line was established in 98, embryonic stem cell research has promised to treat debilitating conditions like cancer, heart disease, Alzheimer's, and spinal cord injuries. Um, however, because Congress has banned US federal funding for research involving the destruction of human embryos, opportunities for research has been limited. 
Most research is conducted by private entities or on a limited number of pre-existing cell lines um, without the support of federal dollars. Granting, granting embryos personhood status would effectively shut down even those means for conducting embryonic stem cell research and have far-reaching effects on biomedical research. And finally, declaring embryos to be persons paves the way for state or federal bans on abortion from the moment of fertilization. As of last month, 23 states had introduced bills to ban abortion by establishing fetal personhood specifically. These bills, because they treat embryos and fetuses the same as those who have already been born, have no carve out allowing for abortions in cases of rape or incest or for fetuses with devastating genetic anomalies. Despite more than 300 attempts in Congress to introduce constitutional amendments granting fetal personhood, the doctrine of fetal personhood has not yet gained significant traction at the federal level. However, that might be shifting after Dobbs. Proponents of fetal personhood argue that the 14th Amendment of the Constitution gives, quote, equal protection of the laws to all, including a fertilized egg. In Roe versus Wade, the Supreme Court explicitly said that, quote, the word person, as used in the 14th Amendment, does not include the unborn. While the Dobbs decision, which overrules Roe v. Wade and Casey, uh, Planned Parenthood versus Casey, did not declare that embryos are constitutional persons under the law with the rights to due process and equal protection under the 14th Amendment, it also didn't say they were not. Um, the Melissa Murray and Kate Shaw, both law professors, argue that the Dobbs decision is a, quote, way station en route to a more permanent resolution, the recognition of fetal personhood and the total abolition of legal abortion in the United States. Granting a fetus the same rights as, person, as a person would mean abortion for any reason is illegal. Although the Supreme Court hasn't yet declared embryos to be persons under the law, just last week, it heard arguments in the case Idaho versus the United States. In that case, the court is considering whether the Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act, or EMTALA, preempts Idaho, Idaho's abortion ban in situations in which terminating a person's pregnancy is required to stabilize an emergency medical condition that would otherwise threaten serious harm to the pregnant person's health, but the state prohibits a physician from providing that care. Idaho's abortion law requires transferring a patient in medical crisis out of state, which directly conflicts with EMTALA, which was explicitly enacted to end the practice of patient dumping. EMTALA, the law, references the unborn child, Presumably, however, to ensure that the law extends to circumstances where the fetus requires stabilizing care. Idaho argued that the federal statute demands equal treatment for the life of the pregnant person and the, quote, unborn child. A decision in this case is expected in June. However, um, and it's still a distinct possibility that a future Supreme Court opinion will group embryo destruction as more like abortion because of its involvement with the destruction of human life. Currently then, it seems that it is the political and not the constitutional considerations that are preventing states from restricting and, and the federal government from restricting or prohibiting IVF or other types of assisted reproductive technologies. IVF seeks to create life. It is widely supported across political spectrums. And in an election year, the anti-abortion position is relatively unpopular with votes in about, uh, uh, the, with about 70% of the population supporting uh, um, the legal right to seek, a, the right to seek a legal abortion. So as we see from the arguments in the Idaho decision, as well as the opinion in LePage, state or even federal recognition of fetal personhood is a very real possibility, which could pave the way to an outright ban on abortion in all circumstances in the United States. 
And on that happy note, I will stop. Thank you. You all have heard me speak for about three hours today. So, <laughs> yes, Dr. Angels. The concurrence. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that seems sort of violating the separation of church and state. Uh, and so, like, is there no recourse then to question this on constitutional grounds? So that concurrence, uh, that 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 opinion that I pulled up, that's the concurrence, and so that is not legally binding. Uh, concurrences are written where a justice agrees with the outcome of the case, but not with uh, the reasoning. And so the reasoning of the majority did not so heavily rely on um, language of God and um, et cetera. So as far as sort of having a, a, a legitimate reason for appealing it to the Supreme Court, that doesn't exist in this specific language. Um, that said, uh, you know, there, there really isn't a federal constitutional issue in the page because this decision uh, was, um, the, the case was decided based on uh, state law as well as the state constitutional language. Um, so this case itself probably won't work its way or end up in front of the Supreme Court. Um, before this most recent, so um, the Idaho decision um, is the first case that the Supreme Court is hearing on abortion since Dobbs. Um, previously, it declined to hear a case that actually was on the issue of fetal personhood. So thus far, it's keeping its hands clean of the fetal personhood decision. Although during the oral arguments in, um, uh, in the Idaho case, Justice Alito, who wrote the decision in Dobbs, uh, raised the fetal personhood issue and seemed inclined to move in that direction. One other question that is, you know, you commented on the speed with which the Alabama legislature drafted by the judges passed this. So I guess I'm curious, do you believe that that was because for political reasons and bad policy or because of the business factors, huge business opportunities? Yeah, I think it's both. Um, I think IVF has historically been supported by both by those from both political parties. Um, there's definitely segments of uh, particularly the Republican Party that would argue against it and have. Um, but generally, it's been supported. So A, I think uh, there's definitely the political backlash that there that it was concerned about. Um, and that's why, you know, it's such a limited decision. It doesn't address personhood at all. It lets that part stand. Um, all it's doing is giving some immunity and only some immunity to some parties. So that's why actually one of the major IVF clinics in the state still hasn't reopened despite this law being passed um, because they're still worried about the, the legal exposure. Um, but I think the state, rec it was, it was an all Republican legislature that uh, passed this law, but I think they were still worried about the political pushback um, as we've seen in other states that have been um, enshrining abortion. Like anytime abortion has been on the ballot since the Dobbs decision, um, it's won. So I think there's sort of that recognition, but also IVF is a moneymaker. Um, these clinics make a, uh, bring in a ton of revenue for the state. And so the idea that they have to now transfer hundreds of thousands of embryos out of state um, and that all those folks who would pursue assisted reproduction would have to leave the state is really problematic for the state.
right. Well, thank you all. Yeah. <laughs> 